Well, um, welcome, Jado. Thank you. Very good to see you again. And um, just before we begin, small congratulations, because I think uh, we can all um, judge that not only are you, gonna, are you running the oldest P2P in the world, but pretty soon now you'll be running one of the youngest banks as well, since you've just raised a whole lot of regulatory capital, which I'm sure you won't leave lying around for very long. Thank you. Um, I think it's an indicator of uh, quite how strange the world in which we both work is that to argue that being customer centric um, is disruptive. Oh. oh, I think it's come back on. To argue that um, you can be disruptive simply by being customer centric. Um, yes. I think that's a fairly strange position to start from, but it's the one we're going to explore in the next few minutes. So um, I think if I went into any major financial institution, and certainly into any uh, fintech challenger, they would all tell me that they are intensely customer-centric. No one admit to the opposite. No one would admit to the opposite. So why then is the sort of standard industry incumbent version of being customer-centric not enough? What's wrong with it? Why aren't they right? I mean, you have to ask customers that. So if you ask customers, you will see that if the incumbents were truly customer-centric, you would not have the level of dissatisfaction uh, that customers have to, today towards financial services, the lack of trust. I mean, it was last year, I think the FCA came out with this report of, in the Financial Life Survey, where it said that more than 60% of UK adults do not have confidence or trust in their, uh, in their, in their main financial services provider. So if they were truly customer-centric, you would not have uh, these kind of metrics going around. And if you look, at why that, that's happening, I think the first and the most fundamental reason uh, is, uh, 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 is the business model that these guys use. So let's like, take a you know, look at two products that often a lot of, a lot of us carry around. Let's start with credit cards, which is where my uh, experience before Zopa was. Now, the credit card in itself is a fantastic instrument. It allows you to spend anywhere in the world uh, using a piece of plastic, increasingly just your phone, uh, and then gives the customer the, uh, the convenience of paying back at a, when, you know, at a pace that they feel good for them. It's a fantastic product, right? But yet, uh, if it's, a pro it's a product that customers love to hate. Uh, and why is that? It's, it's because of A, the product design has become increasingly more and more complicated, uh, making it very hard for people to understand. And where is that? There, there is lack of understanding, there is lack of trust. Uh, the second is that you know, most banks today attract uh, these uh, consumers on credit cards using very long 0% teasers. Uh, with the hope that consumers will forget to switch, right, uh, and thus pay interest. And most customers <coughs> enter into it expecting not to pay interest, and more than half end up paying interest. So you've created a business model which, in effect, is adversarial in nature. Mm -hmm. It makes the customer uh, do things that is not in, within their rational uh, benefit, and that, of course, leads to distrust. Uh, but even when there are uh, firms, and there are some, uh, that have the best interest in mind, uh, the fact that uh, they do not own their own, own operating model, right? They're heavily outsourced, and in particular in technology, means that their ability to actually drive real change and offer customers the experience that they really want uh, is increasingly not within their control, right? Uh, and that combination means that today finance uh, is an industry probably as hated uh, as airlines and ambulance chasing lawyers, right? Uh, so clearly customer centricity would be a breath of fresh, fresh air in the world of financial services, and that's what we at Zopa want to do. Sure, um, and obviously not punishing your loyal customers would be a Indeed. Good, good place to start. Yes, yes. So yeah, as we're kind of thinking about uh, kind of creating uh, our bank, uh, we want to kind of take a look at the practices that we have had in the peer to peer industry for the last 13 years, uh, where you know, we have built loyalty, built trust. More than 85% of our customers would trust us and recommend us uh, to their friends uh, and family. And the reason they're able to do that is that we actually have created products that are easy and simple to understand. Uh, but more importantly, if you stay with us, you get benefits. So if you're, if you're investing with us, most of our investors actually relend their money. And at times, when we have to choose between those existing investors and new investors, we've always said that we will actually prioritize those existing investors, as evidenced from the fact that we had a waiting list last year. Uh, and the deal that the existing investors get uh, is, is always going to be as good, at least as good, uh, as what we attract the new investors with. And that means uh, that they can trust uh, that they're getting a fair deal. And we want to take that same ethos uh, to two products in particular, where I think loyalty has been punished. Savings. So if you have a, if you have a savings term deposit product, 
most banks would hope that they will renew with you while you don't notice the rate that you're getting, because more often than not, the rate you get uh, is worse than yeah. they would be attracting. So you get a business. teaser rate. Yes. They cut it. Cut it yeah. yeah. And credit cards that I talked about. And in both of these, we want to uh, kind of change the model uh, and actually incentivize loyalty uh, rather than punish loyalty, because we think mm -hmm. that builds trust, uh, and we think that's that's core of customer centricity. Yeah. So it's partly the product design, but also I guess you must be talking about the culture of the organization as well, the internal yes. culture, because you know, banks, big incumbent banks have been notoriously sales driven. People are heavily incentivized to sell. That's why they have teaser rates, to make the selling easier. Yep. And therefore, people are brought in on a low rate and then punished for staying. Well, it's not as much as, you know, they are, uh, I think, you know, uh, the banking industry, particularly over the last 10 years, and thanks to a lot of the uh, effort from the regulators, have been increasingly focused on improving uh, that culture and making sure that uh, they're trying to take customers' best interest in mind. But I think what fails them is that structure where often you have two different kind of silos. One is about, you know, you've got an entire team, the marketing team, uh, the new customer acquisition team. Uh, and then you have the customer management team, and they can, they can sit separately. Mm -hmm. And two, you have got the business team and the technology team, and they also sit separately. Uh, and that creates a, a myriad of uh, incentives within the, uh, within the organization, which then makes it very hard for them to manage uh, and optimize around and think around the customer lifecycle end to end. And the way we are trying to tackle that, and we have tackled that in the peer to peer uh, uh, business we have, and will do to so in the backing, mm -hmm. is actually create cross functional teams which have the, uh, the business intent creation, uh, the risk analysis uh, that you need to do, uh, as well as the technology and the operating delivery. Uh, but they are end to end for a product. So if you think about you know, a loan product, uh, we can think about that uh, from an end to end, from both attracting the customer, retaining them, and actually kind of managing their uh, existing relationship with that. And that means that you, know, you don't suddenly have this handoff uh, when the teaser rate expires and suddenly it's somebody else's problem uh, to keep that customer happy, trusting and retaining them. Uh, the person who's attracting the customer onto the platform uh, is, is equally responsible uh, for retaining them and actually main, and giving them an excellent experience. And I think that uh, delivers a far better result uh, from a customer standpoint. But I guess it also delivers a better result if it works from your standpoint Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Because presumably you're not having to put out all of this marketing spend yeah. to f get people into the top of the funnel yes. so, if they trust you. Uh, and I think this is you know, true about banking. It's also true about another industry. There's a huge amount of marketing spend uh, either in actually uh, in spend, spend to, uh, in advertising, uh, in kind of commissions to third parties, or actually in terms of these big teaser rates. Uh, because about half the customers would end up leaving you after the teaser rate, and you have to make the money that you lost on those guys. On the other half, the poor suckers who stayed with you, right? Uh, and that means you're kind of building a business which actually almost attracts at a, at a very high pace. But instead, uh, if you build a business which, uh, where customers come to you and there is no reason for them to leave, in fact, there is an incentive to stay, then you can r dramatically reduce your marketing spend. Uh, we haven't done uh, kind of any advertising to speak of over, over the past 13 years, and yet have been kind of growing at more than 50% year on year. And that's because we tend to retain uh, most of the customers we have. And the customers, even say loan customers, they tend to pay back their loan. But two, three, four years down the line, when they actually want another loan, they remember the experience we had. And an overwhelming majority of them, almost 80% of them, come back directly to us. Uh, instead of going through a third party or having to kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, look at an ad, they just come back directly to us, which means our marketing costs remain low. Also, uh, the attrition on the book is low, which means that you actually build a business uh, that continuously grows, and it kind of you enter a virtuous cycle there. Uh, yeah. As compared to the vicious cycle, where you have to continuously spend on marketing, uh, which then means you have to kind of extract more rent, if you will, uh, on the book that's left with you. Sure. Now, that's obviously um, been your experience in peer-to-peer, -peer, where you've built Zopa. Yes. But I guess that's partly because you were doing something new and you weren't doing anything that banks were directly competing with for the lender side. For the lender side, that's true, yes. Uh, but you're going to be going into markets yeah. where banks are exceptionally competitive and they operate on the basis of lots of marketing, low teaser rates to get people in, yeah. and therefore an extraction of profit from loyal customers at the back end. How are you going to win against that when you're not going to treat I mean that, customers at the outset in the way they do. In fact, that exactly is the point of opportunity for us, right? So if you think about, you're right that in the, in the lender or the investor space, we, were, we created the product. We were the first to actually offer 
uh, UK customers an opportunity uh, to make higher returns uh, while taking slightly more risk uh, than an FSCS guaranteed deposit gives you. Uh, but on the borrower side, uh, we've, we've been competing, we've been giving uh, loans to consumers who uh, who would happily be served by their banks, so the yes. banks would love to give them loans. Sure. And we have, we have, we've been able to compete with them uh, over the last 13 years and steal share from them. And that gives me confidence that we can, we can do the same uh, when it comes to credit cards uh, or term deposits. And the practices that you explain in itself for me is, is, is what creates that opportunity for us. Uh, and the other opportunity, you know, which we haven't talked about as much, is the, is the use of technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you think about a customer experience, and I'll again take the personal loan as an example of that and then talk about how we do that in credit cards. Uh, in personal loans, uh, we have fundamentally redefined uh, the expectation of, in terms of how a customer access a personal loan. When uh, even, you know, even today with many, uh, many banks, uh, when you apply for a loan, you do not know what rate you're going to get. You only, all you see uh, is the headline rate. And you, do, you have to apply and thus have a negative impact on your credit history before you get to know yeah. what rate you're going to get. And often the, the, the process, even if you start online, would include, uh, include offline uh, uh, paper, uh, where you have to actually, actually sign uh, a piece of paper and you, actually, you end up getting the loan typically two to three weeks from, uh, from there on. And we have kind of fundamentally changed that uh, journey because when we talk to customers, when they're applying for a loan, what you hear is the fact that, uh, you know, it feels like writing a test, right? You want to know very quickly whether you passed or not uh, and what grade you got. Uh, and so we, within kind of two to three minutes of you coming onto a website, will tell you the exact rate uh, that, uh, that you would get with us. Uh, not the headline rate, but the rate you would get. And uh, we do that with a soft check on your credit bureau, so you can, you're free to just shop around and fact, figure out if you can get a better rate somewhere else. And more than 70% of our customers actually are instantly approved, so they know uh, that they're going to get their loan and they can get their loan the same day. The, and even in cases where we don't, because we have to do a verification, do KYC, the entire process is completely online. Mm -hmm. And a typical end-to-end -end journey is 18 hours uh, from the time of application for a customer. And that's a fundamentally different experience. Yeah. And similarly, if you think about credit cards, uh, to give you some specific examples there, when you talk to customers, the things that they bother about is, A, they don't quite understand what fee they're going to get stuck with. They don't quite understand what's the exact interest rate that's going to be applied on a specific transaction uh, that they make because of the complexity of the product. We remove that complexity. So our credit card, when it launches, will have a single, single interest rate. It will only have two fees. One, if you forget to pay, make your payment, uh, and two, if you use the ATM. Those are both practices we do not want our customers to do. So we want to make sure uh, that they understand that there's a cost associated with that and we are just simply passing on those costs uh, back to the customer. No other fees. That makes it easy for them to understand. A single interest rate, again, easy for them to understand. And the biggest fear customers will have about credit cards, and some of us will feel this, is that they feel they'll get out of control, spend too much, or end up building a debt that they didn't intend to mm -hmm. do. Uh, we'll give customers the control, not just in terms of alerts, but actually being able to send hard spe set hard spending limits for themselves, hard balance limits for themselves, uh, which can be less uh, than what we're willing to offer, which allows them to give that degree of control and make sure uh, the joy of using a credit card is remains without uh, the strength of the anxiety, yeah. anxiety that comes with it. Yeah. Um, how then also are you going to incorporate some of the opportunities that are emerging in open banking into what you're going to do? I mean, how relevant is this going to be for you and how quickly? Yeah. <clears throat> so open banking launched uh, last year um, and it's one of those things where I always fundamentally believe that it's, it's an incredibly powerful change uh, in the way uh, the regulators and the industry and customers will, uh, will look at their data. Because in effect, it gives... It makes obvious what should have been obvious for a long time, that the customer owns the data and they should have the control on who has it uh, and they should have the control on how they want to deal uh, with their financial services uh, operator, whether they want to do that directly or through a trusted third party. Uh, that said, it is in the beginning stages of its implementation and I do think it is a change that will take two to three years uh, to actually completely uh, mm. come, to, uh, you know, uh, come to its full form and customers really adopting it. And part, a lot of that uh, is not because of because that's something fundamentally flawed in the model, mm -hmm. uh, but more so because uh, that the bank, the technology implementation uh, from the bank standpoint uh, takes its time, uh, sure. partly because of the challenges they have with their own legacy infrastructure. Uh, but as that changes, uh, we do believe that it allows us 
and, and other customer-centric firms like us to give customers a full view uh, of their finances, mm -hmm. make, giving them control uh, in terms of uh, making the bank most out of their money and helping them with insight uh, and alerts uh, and information uh, that will make them feel as if they're getting the, the, a fair deal and the best out of their money. And but will that sort of figure in your offer from Absolutely. day one, so, or yes. is it coming? No, it will, it will figure in our, in fact, it might be one of the first offers that we actually launch right. uh, uh, openly uh, to the customers. Uh, uh, it was, you know, right now what open banking offers uh, in a it's kind of production-ready way uh, is the ability to see your accounts uh, yep. from, from different providers in a single, single uh, space. It's called the aggregation service. Uh, so we'll start with that, and come along with that would be insights that we're actually gleaning from that data that will help customers make more uh, better decisions with their finances and being, sure. be more financially fit. So um, obviously regulation has greatly helped the emergence of P2P. Um, and you're moving into a far more regulated space with a bank, of course, yep. uh, hence all the regulatory capital apart from anything else. Yes. Um, but we're also seeing at the moment some changes in P2P regulation under discussion, which arguably are going to make your life a bit harder in that world too. I mean, how is particularly in the marketing restriction to retail investors who are, who are your core, obviously? Yes. Um, what does, what's your view on this? So Zopa has always been a, a huge fan of uh, appropriate regulation for the industry. In fact, we were one of the, I mean, our founder Giles was one of the first people actually lobbying for uh, getting regulation uh, into the sector. Uh, and we thought it was a great win for us in 2014 when the FCA started regulating the sector because it's important that customers are, uh, uh, there are good practices in the, in the industry and customers are protected from detriment. Uh, now, as we look at the P2P industry today, it, it covers a very, very wide range of, uh, of providers. At one end, we have providers like Zopa, uh, which uh, give, do low-risk consumer lending uh, from an investor standpoint, actually ensure that they get a very diversified set of loan book, and is incredibly transparent to its investors about the performance of their loan book and the returns that they get. I consider that uh, one of the lowest risk forms of investments uh, you can make uh, today in the UK. To, uh, to, to other platforms where investors can pick and choose the loans that they want to mm -hmm. do, often end up making large loans to single entities, often property uh, or businesses. And that's a higher risk. Uh, I mean, I would say that would be more akin to crowd funding. And so uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, industry actually now effectively encompasses a very wide uh, end of risk and returns. Uh, and what we think is, would be appropriate is to actually look at it that way and ensure that uh, the regulation is kind of fit for purpose for all of those business models. So we do think that while marketing restrictions would be somewhat, somewhat uh, appropriate uh, for places where investors are able to pick and choose investments and put, uh, or loans, uh, and put significant amount of capital to work against a single entity or a single business, I think there, there I think we do want to make sure that the investors are sophisticated in the way they're making those decisions versus places like ours where they're getting a very diversified pool of assets uh, and uh, there is a reasonable investment uh, in, the, uh, in the way risk management is done. Uh, we, do, we do not think uh, that something like marketing restrictions would be, would be appropriate mm -hmm. and that's what we actually put, put out in our, uh, in our response, to, uh, in our consultation with the FCA and we hope that's where we end up. That said, you know, as, if, as, a, uh, as a business, we've never actually marketed for investors. Our investor growth has always been uh, kind of through word of mouth, sure. uh, our customers recommending their friends and family. So uh, as a business, it doesn't impact us that much, but we do not think it's appropriate to actually preclude uh, normal uh, UK consumers uh, from the ability to invest in what we think uh, is a low risk uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, good return asset. There's some suggestion that the industry is thinking about an alternative to this, this blanket ban in introducing some sort of appropriateness, suitability test yes. for people coming on. Yeah. Is that something that is sort of part of your thinking for Zopa? Yeah, we do think that uh, uh, an appropriateness test, I mean, for in fact, you know, if you look at the, uh, the FCA principles on treating customers fairly, one of the things is that you design products and services that are appropriate for your target customer. Right. Uh, for us, the target customer is uh, uh, the average UK consumer. Uh, and for us, the appropriateness test would involve uh, making sure that they understand uh, the fact that what they're doing is consumer lending, uh, they understand the risks of the product, uh, and then they understand that, uh, that uh, uh, as with most investments, there is a, their capital is at risk. Uh, if they 
are able to attest that, that they understand that, then we think it's appropriate for them to uh, invest in our platform, and that would be the, the right appropriateness test for us. Yeah. It might be different uh, for other platforms, but we are very supportive of that. Right. Um, we've got a few minutes. I think we may have one or two questions uh, from the audience, Peter. Um, yes, uh, we've got a few questions here. Let's, um, so the first one uh, for JDev, how, do you, how will you differentiate Zopa from the other digital bank offerings like Monzo and Starling, and not, not to mention Revolut? It's a question I'm often asked. Uh, I think uh, uh, we'd start with a few things, right? So A, the business model itself. So if you look at uh, Revolut, uh, Monzo, Starling, these are in effect current account uh, banks which hope, to op you know, uh, which hope to monetize the customers that they are actually getting through some uh, forms later, mostly marketplace lending or so on and so forth. Uh, we, in, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the best way to make money in, in consumer finances is actually lend, uh, uh, lend responsibly and actually make money from interest. Uh, and over the last uh, 13 years, we've built a track record of being able to generate those assets uh, by actually lending responsibly to UK consumers. Uh, and in the past, passing on those uh, returns uh, to, our, to our investors and keeping some uh, uh, for ourselves. In the future, we want to actually build on that legacy uh, and lend for ourselves as well. So in effect, share our risk, with, share the risk that some of our investors take uh, as well. And that is a huge differentiation because we have that 13-year track record of actually creating uh, sustainable lending, of, uh, uh, lending assets and actually making money off that. Uh, and that, that is, so both from a business strategy in terms of what customers we want to serve and what needs we want to serve, we actually want to serve the need of uh, people wanting money, and people want to borrow responsibly, uh, and we want to offer them that through our loans, our credit card, the credit card offerings uh, that we have. Uh, and in terms of the business model, uh, we want to actually make money of interest, uh, rather, uh, uh, and that has a, is a far more, I believe, is a far more proven, historically proven business model in the, in the history of banking. You make money by lending. Right, okay, that's all we have time for anyway, but thank, thank you very much, JDev. Thank you, Andy, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.